Welcome to Sustainable Packaging with Corey Connors. Today's guest is my friend, Lindsay Casella, who is the VP of Marketing at Recycle Track Systems and the founder of Rent Your Feed. Hey, Lindsay, how are you? Hi, Corey. It's so nice to see you again. It was awesome to be able to see you in person for the first time a few months ago at Waste Expo, but it's good to be reunited outside of just posting comments on social media <laughs> so often. <laughs> I absolutely and it's such a such an interesting world that we live in being so heavily involved in social media to get to know people virtually and then get to meet them in person it's it's almost a shock like hey you're a real person. <laughs> I agree. It was a great opportunity and just already so many people I'm seeing that we're cross-connected with the sustainability space is a growing one, but still such a small one, but it's great to be bringing more people into the community. Absolutely. Well, first of all, how did you get into sustainability? I know you have a, a fairly vast experience list as a young person and I'm very impressed by it. So how did you get into this world? So I had a very non-traditional way into sustainability, actually very much like yourself. I studied advertising in undergrad and advertising for me was because I loved art, but I knew I couldn't have it as a business or that's what at least people told me. So it seemed a way that I could continue to do what I was good at, which was storytelling, but then bring it to the world. And so I had worked on brand campaigns and agency campaigns all throughout college. And I was really fortunate to get to get an opportunity at one of the leading brands within the marketing space at their home office in Columbus, Ohio. Mm -hmm. At the time, they were very well known for their reputation in marketing with a fashion show with their own models called Angels. And for me, it was the opportunity to ultimately make a name for myself in this space and show that I was aligned to this huge marketing entity. But what I quickly realized is not everything you see in marketing is what's actually true. So. Um, I had actually set up time to meet with a production partner. Part of the reason that I had done this is if you move 500 miles from your friends and family, you really need to be able to understand why you're there, what's happening. And in the conversation that I was having was more so me just being curious as a marketer, why products were going to be late to stores. And what I learned is there were a lot of things I didn't know about how our business was run, mostly specifically to our supply chain. This was pre-COVID, so people didn't have supply chain conversations regularly. And what I did learn was actually at the time, our clothing and garments were going to be late because our factories were closed. And at that point, I didn't know that there were one people in the factories that were creating our garments. Here I was in a technological world, mid 2010s, 15, 16. I thought we were past that, but I learned that it was real people and our factories were closed because they actually couldn't breathe because the air quality was so bad where they would go to work. And at wow. the time, I was creating a campaign on the marketing side asking or telling people that our brand supported our customers and wanted to provide scholarships. And it felt really wrong that on the opposite side, we were disenfranchising um, women who looked a lot like me and just ended up in, in a different situation. So from there, I went to work for their largest competitor on the agency side. And I realized the supply chain was the same, maybe just a little bit better. And I had heard about TerraCycle in undergrad in an entrepreneurship class. They were talking about this guy named Tom Zaki, who you've had on the podcast and I know you're a fan of. And at the time when I was in undergrad, he was doing worm poop in recycle <laughs> bottles. So maybe not as exciting as moving to work in fashion retail, <laughs> but he had just made the announcement at the World Economic Forum about Loop. And I knew you needed to, to work with the largest polluters to have the largest impact. And I'm originally from New Jersey and was beyond excited for the opportunity. So I actually emailed him directly. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you got the job. Yeah. Ultimately, I got the job and I had been doing stuff as well, staying involved in the fashion retail space, working with a nonprofit to help garment workers get paid during the pandemic and just increase overall consumer education about what's actually happening in factories around the world. That's amazing background. And I love to hear all, all the positive effects you're having, not only on sustainability, but on people. 
And that's the ultimate goal here, right? Is to, to make the world a safer place for all of us to live a, a healthy life. And well done. Kudos to you. So let's talk about Rent Your Feed. I'm so excited for this program and company that you're building and I want to talk it through. So can you explain it to us? Yeah, absolutely. So Right Your Feed has been an idea that I've been sitting on and brainstorming and sharing with anyone who is willing to listen for the last few years. It really started as my own personal frustration. One of the things with sustainability today, and I know you talk a lot about on this podcast, is just it's a privilege to be able to be in this space and to have it as a top priority. And for me, what I started to notice is a lot of the sustainable solutions are not accessible to those who can't afford them. And so how can we create the option for people to be able to join the movement and also to empower them to be a part of it? So okay. Write Your Feed is a circular community closet that ultimately allows people to share their garments and what's in their closet peer to peer. So think about Uber, you hop into someone else's car, this is you hopping into someone else's clothing. It's very similar to the idea of rentals. The only difference is with rentals, there's a lot of emissions in terms of things being shipped to and from distribution centers, and you're ultimately still using fast fashion because things are getting added to the platform, things are being removed, and obviously with fast fashion, there's huge impacts, not just from an emission perspective, but water and energy as well. Yeah, great point. So this will, people will be able to sign up and basically try clothes for a little while and then send them back to uh, someone locally to them. Yes. Is that kind so of? Your feed hopes to allow people to actually be able to provide their garments on a platform that they are not physically willing to let go of. So I here in New York City have a limited closet, but a pretty full one. And most people actually only use 20% of their closet 80% of the time. There's obviously a lot of great secondhand sites where you can sell those items, the 80% that you're not using. But sometimes you're like, I'm holding on to this for that one occasion or... <laughs> I only use this for this one event and you're otherwise just sitting on the opportunity for this asset to be used and the opportunity now is to allow you to make passive income so feed your rent and then also to list those items without having to create new content by using what's already existing on your social media feed so hence the word feed not in terms of food but also <laughs> in terms of your actual social account so it really it. helps to help simplify, it help, helps to hopefully create passive income. And then ultimately, I think the most exciting thing about this is it actually allows there to be a community orientedness around fashion. So for me, I had started to do this actually by accident. I had done 90 day new, new clothing challenge and the challenge ultimately became a lifestyle for me. I'm now over three years without any new clothing, wow. uh, but there were a lot of events along the way where, Hey, I could have find this while thrifting or I couldn't use something that I already had but I saw on social media something that my friend who lived down the block had used and I had in previous lives in going to college living with two sisters had borrowed clothing I thought how crazy would it be to ask this person I'm familiar with but maybe not best friends with if I can lend <laughs> it them and you would be shocked how many people were excited for their item to be used and then also to have a little monetary gain as well was always a really nice plus. So ultimately, I'm really excited for Rent Your Feed because personally, it was a huge opportunity for me as I tried to break up with fast fashion. And then also hopefully it will allow more people to be able to access a sustainable clothing solution. It's really incredible and very impressive to think how much we could do in the fashion world to be more sustainable. There's, there's a lot of work to be done. And I think uh, you're just scratching the surface here, but I could imagine this being a global phenomenon and probably hyper-local kind of you know, system. But did your experience at Loop prepare you for this concept? Absolutely. My experience at Loop and TerraCycle helped tremendously. It was the first startup I had ever joined. So to see how things were built from the ground up, we had started at the time as a pilot on the East Coast that now is fully available in five countries, working with all different types of retailers and all different types of consumers, whether they be new parents looking for diapers with Charlie Banana, 
to someone like yourself shopping at a Fred Meyers in Portland owned by Kroger. It was really interesting to be able to see just the nature of how vast reuse can be used and deployed. But I also think a big learning and motivation for me was realizing that depending on where reuse is geographically will then depend on the access, the success of the program. So yep. ultimately here in the U.S., we're starting to see some glimmers of hope with the climate bill passing through the Senate and then also with some EPR in states scattered across the country. But there's still a lot of work to be done and EPR regulates from state to state. And so what we're starting to see is depending on where the government is either funding or having a larger part in those conversations is allowing those platforms to be a little bit more successful than others. So I think ultimately what's going to drive the most impact is going to be consumer demand. And so what better way to do that than ultimately create something that's made for the people, by the people, to be used by the <laughs> I by love them. that. <laughs> and like you said, not only will the person lending the clothes make some money, but the person borrowing the clothes will spend less money. So you're saving money and you're making money at a time in our history when the economy is not so good and people are struggling. And many people are without jobs. And this is absolutely a brilliant solution to a way to spruce up your wardrobe and try new things. Love it. Yeah, because anyone in the sustainability movement will tell you just consume less. But the ultimate thing with fashion and where we live is people are going to still want to keep their wardrobe looking cool and being up to date. And so I don't think you should have to trade being able to have and live a fashionable lifestyle. I think you can still do so with being sustainable. And it comes at a time when you have reports coming now where People are showing the, or scientists, not people, are showing that there's carcinogens and microplastics, and a lot of brands have shifted to using recycled bottles, which are very much linked in these processed synthetic materials that have oh. microplastics. So that's ultimately not the solution, and polyester definitely isn't, and that's what most of fast fashion is produced by. And you have a time now where fossil fuels are, the, or the cost of gas is more than ever that would also then in part go to fast fashion. So I think to encourage people to use what they have and not create anything new is just ultimately what every industry should be doing. And, and it's a hard thing to say, or it's a hard thing to swallow for a lot of us that are in the, like myself in the packaging world, you know, here I am a salesperson trying to sell boxes and also saying, Hey, but only use them if you need them and only use the smallest one possible and only use the, the least amount of packaging possible. It's, it's kind of a, an interesting balance. <laughs> I think one of the things going back to that I learned from TerraCycle and Tom is waste as we know it is a modern problem. It's only been really since the fifties and post-World Wars that we started to create such a disposable culture. And yes. so if you look back, things were made to last, things were made to be mended and repaired and mm -hmm. um, you can continue to create, but maybe it's just thinking about the value of that creation and what durability actually means. Yeah, when I met Tom and we're talking about Tom Zaki, the CEO of TerraCycle and Loop for all the audience listening, he, one of the first stories he told me about was how he meets with students at a local college every year a different class of freshmen and he talks about cobbling shoes and one of the students raised their hand and said Mr. Zaki what does cobble mean you know and <laughs> he had to explain that he's talking about fixing shoes and it's it's you're right it's it's a new development and the more I look at sustainability in the world the more I look back to the history of how we used to do things. We used to repair things. We used to reuse things. We used to buy two pairs of pants a, a, in two years. Whereas now, I think Tom told me the average person buys 65 articles of clothes a year. That's a lot for one person. Yeah, definitely. It is going to the point of the cobbling of the shoes and repair something, these trades that we lost, but I think you're starting to see getting signs that they're coming back at Recycle Track Systems, where I work full-time in marketing for one of our accounts is Tapestry, who's the parent mm. company of Coach. 
And Coach has actually created a pro program called Reloved, where they are encouraging people to send back their purses to be repaired. And oh, in wow. some cases where some items are past the point of repair, they're actually breaking them down and taking the pieces that are usable and turning them into something totally different. So maybe it's used towards a pocket or using the strap that's going to replace someone who doesn't have a strap. And then anything that's not used, which is what we're helping them do is move to being fully zero waste. They're actually then putting towards insulation and stuffing and it's going used in other points of their store. So they're actually even bringing it fully circular within their entire ecosystem. So I think being really intentional as a brand and as a company is definitely possible. And how cool to be a large organization that has a lot of things already out in the world and say, hey, what we created was great. Let's bring it back. <laughs> Find ways to improve it. Let's create a marketplace of these items. And I think that speaks larger to the consumer demand ultimately for it. And it's, it's a huge market for repurposed clothing and items. I had a podcast with a company called Ridwell and they, they work with a company called, I think it's called Threads and it's local here in Oregon or the Northwest. And what they do is they recycle old clothes and turn them in, whether it be a blanket or a new, one of the things they showed me was like a satchel. And I thought she said the the executive director of Ridwell Taylor, she said that they sell out of those every single time they do them in less than a day. Wow. Talk about demand for, you know, I think you're right. People want to tell a story like, oh, where'd you get that shirt? Well, I borrowed it from a friend or I borrowed it through this really cool app, you know, rent your feed, or I bought it through this recycling program. It's a cool story. Yeah, I think too, things are, shouldn't be meant to be disposed. There should be value behind it. It's like going to the library and picking up a book and you seeing, oh my gosh, this cool older classman I knew had took this book out before me and you can then have a conversation about the piece or, or in not, not the piece, but about the book and ask their opinion on it. I think the same thing goes for clothing is it's meant to be there for really important milestones in your life, whether you're going in for an interview or going to a special wedding or event. And so why not be able to share that with other people? Absolutely exciting. And I want to kind of focus on how people can get a hold of you and your, your new, your new company and, and your current role too. Is there a website we can go to or a, an app yeah. we can download? So for my full-time gig, definitely follow all things zero waste.com, which is where I spend a lot of our energy and putting a lot of open source content out so people can go, become educated on just sustainable solutions, things they can implement in their own life. And then also as companies, if you're thinking of how can I improve, how can I address my sustainability goals and my diversion reporting, it's a great place to go. And then for my baby, which is right your feed, I would say you can find it at rentyourfeed.com or contact me directly. And I'm on all social medias and all places. And I think also for people who are just new to the sustainability space, or obviously not anyone who's the avid listeners to your podcast, but some of the fashion community or people in my network who might come here, uh, one of the early ways that I started was listening to podcasts like this one, and then also watching documentaries and reading. And there's so many incredible resources out there. I have to give a shout out for the two that I actually inspired me. Uh, <laughs> was Stink, the movie that actually talks about what are in garments and then the true cost. So really knowing what's behind the supply chain of the fashion industry. So yeah, I wouldn't be here without all of my own experiences and then the stories that other creators had put into the world. Absolutely. Well said. And for example, you, you just sent me this book. Thank you. This is our friend, Tom Zaki's book. Yes. Uh, out, um, outsmart waste and thank you for sending me that Lindsay. i appreciate that and you sent me some other things a bag and really cool reusable water bottle i'm thrilled to have and just appreciative that this world that we've joined it's totally cool to send somebody something in a used box which i do all the time i just did a tiktok post about it so thank you for doing that and a repurposed item I was thrilled. I can't wait. Thank you so much. And it's, 
I think it goes to exactly what you were saying. Reusing or repurposing is so valuable in this world. So let's keep doing that. Yes, let's do it. We can and will have a difference because May and your entire family is going to hold us accountable to do so. <laughs> yes, our kids, absolutely. We're thrilled. Like you said, they were on the podcast a few weeks ago. That was really fun. But they ask me all the time, hey, dad, is this recyclable? Should I buy this? Is this a good item? To and so we're, we're training them one at a time. <laughs> so bringing them into the mix. <laughs> well, thanks again, Lindsay, and we appreciate you. Thank you, Landsberg Aurora, for sponsoring this podcast. If you're listening, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And give us a review. We really appreciate that.